This morning we continue our series on a new look at the blessed hope. And the title of our study together is Four Portraits of the Millennium. Now the word millennium does not appear in the Bible. Uh, but what the word means does. The word millennium means a thousand years. And so in our presentation today we are going to study about the thousand years of Revelation chapter 20. Now I'd like to begin by saying that Revelation chapter 20 presents four different but complementary perspectives of the events that take place during the thousand years. Four complementary but overlapping views of the millennium. It's kind of like putting four colors on a sheet one at a time, one on top of the other. Basically these four views of the millennium are repetitive cycles. In other words, uh, it'll give us one view and then it'll focus on a different perspective or a different aspect. The third view will be different and the fourth will be different as well, but they all come complement each other. In other words, in order to catch a full picture of what takes place during the millennium, we must have all four views superimposed one on the other. Now I'm going to mention the four outlines in Revelation chapter 20 and the first eight verses of chapter 21 so that we know where we're going as we begin our study. The first cycle, or the first view of the millennium, is found in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 to 3. The center of focus in this particular uh, portion, or this particular view of the millennium, is Satan and the condition of the earth during the millennium. In other words, Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3, the center of focus is Satan and the condition of the earth during the thousand years. The second view or the second perspective has to do with a view of the saints during the thousand years, the righteous, the saved during the thousand years. This perspective is found in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 4 through 10. In other words, in those verses the center of focus is upon the righteous saints who are saved during the thousand years. The third view of the millennium is found in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 through chapter 21 and verse 1. And the center of focus on this particular passage is on the wicked, the unrighteous during and after the thousand years. And finally, the fourth perspective is Revelation chapter 21 and verses 2 through 8. And the center of focus in this outline or this view is the holy city and God. What will it be like to live with God in the holy city? Now each one of these cycles repeats. We're going to find that each one of them begins with events at the initiation of the millennium, goes through the events during the millennium, and culminates at, with the events that take place at the conclusion of the thousand years. Once again, the four outlines are Revelation 20, 1 to 3, the center of focus, Satan and the earth. Revelation 20 verses 4 through 10, the center of focus is upon the saints. Number three, Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 uh, through chapter 21 and verse 1, the center of focus is upon the wicked. And finally, Revelation 21 verses 2 through 8, the center of focus is upon life in the holy city with God. Now it goes without saying that the event which marks the beginning of the millennium is the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, the chapter before Revelation 20, Revelation chapter 19, describes the second coming of Jesus. He's sitting on a white horse and he's followed by the armies of heaven. He's coming to the earth to deliver his people from the death decree, from being destroyed by the powers of the earth. So in other words, the event which immediately precedes the millennium or the thousand years is the second coming of Christ. 
Now let's take a look at the first view or the first portrait of the millennium which emphasizes Satan and the condition of the earth at the beginning, during, and at the conclusion of the thousand years. This is found in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 to 3. And we're going to notice several details in this passage. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Now let's stop there for a moment and say a few words about the expression bottomless pit. This, by the way, is a gross mistranslation of what the word really means. The word in Greek in which the New Testament was written is the word abusos, where we get our word abyss from. In other words, a more proper translation would be having the key of the abyss. Now, it's interesting to notice as you go back to the Old Testament, to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, that the same word is used in a different language. In other words, the exact equivalent word to abusos is the Hebrew word tehom, which appears in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says, where it speaks about the deep. There it is translated the deep. Now you're probably saying, how do we know, Pastor Bohr, that uh, the word uh, tehom, deep, in Genesis 1 verse 2, is equivalent in Hebrew to the word abusos in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1 in Greek. How do we know that the Hebrew word and the Greek word are cognate terms or, or have the same idea? Well, the reason very simple. Whenever in the Old Testament you have the word tehom, which is translated deep in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Whenever you have the word tehom, it is translated into the Greek Old Testament, the Greek version of the Old Testament, known as the Septuagint, with the word abusos. In other words, whenever in the Old Testament you have the word tehom in the Hebrew, the Greek translation of the Old Testament presents the word abusos. That's the reason we know that tehom, the word deep in Genesis 1 and verse 2, is equivalent in a different language to the word abusos in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. Now why have I taken the time to underline this point? Simply because we need to understand what the word deep means in Genesis 1 and verse 2, because that's the condition in which the earth is going to be in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1, because they are the same word in different languages. Now, I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, and let's examine that word. The same word, abyss, but in the Hebrew instead of the Greek. It says there in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And now notice this. And the earth was how? Without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the what? Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Three things that I want us to notice from this verse. Number one, it says that the earth was without form. Secondly, the earth was void. By the way, the word void means empty. And without form, it means that it could not sustain life. It was disorderly. I like the version in Spanish. It's much closer to what the words mean. In Spanish, it says desordenada y vacía. For those of you who know Spanish, in a disorderly state and empty. That's what without form and void means. And then you'll notice that the planet also was filled with darkness. Three ideas, without form, void, and in darkness. That's what the word deep describes in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Now, if in Revelation 20 verse 1, it's the same word but in a different language, we would expect the earth to be reduced to the same condition as it was at the beginning before creation. Are you understanding my point? And that's exactly what we find right before the millennium is a world which is which returns basically to the condition it was in before creation. Now, how do we know that? All of you have heard the fact that before uh, the millennium, there will fall upon planet Earth seven devastating plagues. Have you ever heard of the seven last plagues? 
They afflict the whole earth. Have you ever noticed that the seven plagues reverse creation? Every single one of the plagues afflicts something which God made during creation week. The fifth plague is darkness. God made light. Under the, under the uh, third plague, the rivers, the fresh waters are, are turned into blood. Under the second plague, all of the fish die. Jeremiah says that when the plagues fall, the birds of the sky are gone. There are no more birds. Uh, under the fourth plague, the, the sun burns all of the vegetation. There's no vegetation left, which God made the third day. And when uh, the seventh plague comes, it says in Revelation chapter 16 that all human beings will die on planet Earth, the human beings that were made during creation week. In other words, the seven last plagues actually are a reversal of creation. The seven last plagues return this world to the condition that it was in before creation, as described, without form and void and darkness over the face of the deep. So basically, who could live on planet Earth during the thousand years, technically speaking, after the seven last plagues? It will be an inhospitable wilderness. It will be a place which is without form and void. By the way, in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23, Jeremiah was allowed to see the world as it will be during the thousand years. He says there in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23 the following. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was what? It was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Are those the same characteristics that we found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2? The same three? Yes, without form, void, and darkness over the face of the deep. And you can read in Jeremiah for the context, it's describing this world as it will be destroyed and turned upside down when Jesus comes. So in other words, this world will be reduced or returned to pre-creation chaos. By the way, if we could also read from Isaiah chapter 24, we won't do it now. Uh, we've done it in a previous lecture. But there, the expressions that are used about the destruction of this world when Jesus comes are very impressive. I'll read some of them to you. It says there that the Lord will make the earth empty and waste. He will turn it upside down. The earth will mourn and fade away. The inhabitants of the earth will be burned, it says there. The planet will be utterly broken down, clean dissolved, moved exceedingly, are some of the expressions that are used there in Isaiah chapter 24. In other words, this planet will be left empty of everything that God created during creation week and everything will return to a disorderly state and darkness once again will rule all over the world. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 and read verses 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 2 and 3. There we find the following words. Speaking about Satan. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. By the way, that word, expression bottomless pit is the same word abyss. What does the word abyss mean? What does the word deep mean? It, they mean the world in a condition similar to before creation, without form, void, where darkness rules. That's the meaning of the word according to Genesis 1 and verse 2. And the exact cognate term in the New Testament in a different language is the word abyss. And so it says, and it cast him into the bottomless pit, into the abyss, into the deep, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him. In other words, what is God doing with, with Satan at this point? He is actually throwing him where? In prison. He's throwing him into jail. And what happens as a result? It says that he should what? Deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. 
Now, you'll notice here that you have several things said about Satan. Number one, he is cast into this world in a disorderly state, without form, void, full of darkness. We are told there that he is kept there, he's sealed, he's imprisoned for how long? He's imprisoned for a thousand years. And that means that he cannot any longer do what? Deceive the nations. But at the end of the thousand years, what's going to happen with Satan? He is going to be released from his prison, and once again he is going to be able to deceive the nations of the world. So far so good? Now, first outline ends. What has been the center of focus of, these, of this first outline? The condition of the earth, and what else? And what's going to happen with Satan? But when you finish this first outline, there are many questions that remain. Let me share some of those questions with you. Number one, what happened to the righteous during this period? Is there anything about that? in these first three verses. By the way, do these three verses take you to the beginning, during, and the end of the millennium? Sure. It says that at the beginning of the millennium, the earth is without form and void, the devil is bound. He stays bound a thousand years, and after the thousand years, he's what? He's released. That's it. Is there anything in this outline about the righteous during the thousand years? Nothing. Does it say whether the righteous were on earth or in heaven during this period? No. Does it say what, did the right, what the righteous did during the thousand years? Nothing. Does it explain what bind and unbind means? No, it simply says he's bound and then he's unbound. No explanation about what binding and unbinding means. What happened with the wicked who were destroyed at the second coming? Does it say anything about the wicked? Followers of Satan? Nothing. What did Satan deceive the nations to do after the thousand years? Does it say what he deceived them to do? No. What happened to Satan after he was released for a little while? Do, do we know what happens to Satan after he was re released for a little while? No. These are questions which remain. And so the first outline is a very important outline because it tells us what happens to the earth and what will happen to Satan at the beginning, during, and at the end of the thousand years. But it's very sketchy because you don't know anything about the righteous, you don't know anything about the wicked, and you don't know anything about what life is going to be like in the New Jerusalem. And so you need a second outline. And in the second outline we find a portrait of the saints at the beginning, during, and at the end of the thousand years. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Here we're going to have some of our questions answered. Revelation 20 and verse 4. It says here, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. We'll come back to that in a few moments. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Are these the, are these the righteous? Yes. Are these those who remain faithful to God in the final crisis? Absolutely, because the beast, his image, and his mark is imposed at the very end. And so these are the righteous. Now what's going to happen to these righteous people who were killed by these worldwide systems? It says, and they what? And they lived. If they lived, it's because they must have been what? They must have been dead before. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Do they live at the beginning of a thousand years? Of course they do. If they didn't live at the beginning of a thousand years, how could they reign with Jesus a thousand years? Obviously they live, they come to life at the beginning of the thousand years because they were beheaded, they were killed. They come to life at the beginning of the thousand years and then they reign with Jesus a thousand years. Now notice also Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Here it's explicit. It says in Revelation 20 and verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in what? In the first resurrection. Who is blessed and holy? He who takes part in what? In the first resurrection. Let me ask you, if there's a first resurrection, must there be a second? It doesn't make any sense for me to say, this is my first child, if I only have one. 
Obviously, if there's a first resurrection, there must be what? There must be a second resurrection as well. And so it says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the what? The second death. By the way, what did these people suffer? Those who, who resurrected the first resurrection, what, res, what death did they suffer? There must have been the first death because it says that the second death has no power over them. And so it says, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Once again, do the righteous resurrect at the beginning of the millennium? Yes or no? They most certainly do. Because they reign with Christ a thousand years. And their resurrection is called the first resurrection, which means that when they died, they died only the first death. Now notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. It describes this resurrection. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. Here the Apostle Paul says the following, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. First resurrection, the dead in Christ rise what? First. So it's the righteous that resurrect in the first resurrection. And then it says in verse, six, uh, verse uh, 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be, now notice this, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Does Jesus come all the way down at his second coming when he resurrects the righteous? And when he takes the, the, the righteous living to heaven? Absolutely not. It says that we will be what? Caught up in the air. We will uh, be caught up in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. Now notice John chapter 14 verses 2 and 3. John chapter 14 and verses 2 and 3. We studied this in our last uh, study together, in our last lecture together. John 14 verses 2 and 3. Jesus says, in my Father's house. Where is the Father's house? The Father's house is in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven. And so it says here, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. Where did Jesus go to? He went to heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and now notice, and receive you unto myself. Notice he doesn't come to spend a thousand years with us. He says, and receive you unto myself. We will be caught up, as the Apostle Paul said, that where I am, that is in heaven, in his Father's house, that where I am, there ye may be what? There ye may be also. So far, what is the central focus in the verses that we've noticed in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 10? The center of focus is upon the saints, the righteous dead. What's going to happen with them at the beginning of the thousand years when the devil is bound? They're going to be what? They're going to be resurrected. What are they going to do during the thousand years? They're going to reign with Jesus a thousand years. Where are they going to reign with Jesus a thousand years? Jesus said that he was going to take his people where? To his father's house. The apostle Paul says that God's people will be what? Will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. In other words, we see here that the righteous resurrect and they're caught up along with the living righteous to meet Jesus in the air, and then Jesus takes his people where? To his Father's house. Now, what are the righteous going to do during the thousand years? They're going to have a working vacation. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones... By the way, uh, thrones are used in the Bible not only for people who, who um, rule, for kings, they're also used for people who judge. So it says, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Who is they sat upon them? Those who were beheaded, those who died and resurrected in the first resurrection. It says, 
and I saw the souls, we'll discuss this when we deal with the state of the dead in our next series, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So not only are they going to reign, but they are also going to participate in a work of what? In a work of judgment. Judgment was given unto them, it says here. So wherever they're taken, they're going to sit on thrones and they're going to participate in a work of judgment. Immediately, the question begs to be asked, if they are going to participate in a work of, in, of judgment, whom are they going to judge? Are they going to judge the, the heavenly angels, the righteous angels? They don't need a judgment. Are they going to judge the, the inhabitants of other worlds? No, because they never sinned. Are they going to judge the righteous who are already in heaven? No, because they're already there. So the question is, who are they going to judge during the thousand years? Who are the saints going to judge? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3 has the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul uh, tells us, he explains what's going to take place, who's going to be judged. He says there, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the what? That the saints shall judge the world? Now, the word world here is not being used in the sense of the planet. It's speaking about the wicked inhabitants of the planet. For God so loved the what? The world. It's not talking about the physical composition of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the love of the world is enmity against God? It's speaking about the, the world in the sense of worldlings, the wicked. But not only are the saints going to judge the world according to the Apostle Paul, he continues saying, know ye not that we shall judge what? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? What are God's people going to judge? They're going to judge angels. The question is, which angels? The righteous angels or the unrighteous angels? It has to be the unrighteous angels. So when Revelation says that the righteous will sit on thrones and they will, the judgment was given unto them, it means that they are going to judge the world and they are going to judge whom? They are going to judge the angels, the fallen angels. Now go back with me for a moment to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24. There's something very important here. Do you know that the punishment of Satan and the wicked has two stages? Did you know that? That the punishment of Satan and the wicked has two stages? Well, let's take a look at it. Chapter 24 and verse 21. By the way, this chapter is describing the second coming of Christ. It says there, And it shall come to pass in that day, that is the, when Jesus comes, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. What is the host of the high ones? I preached a whole sermon on this once here at the church. It's speaking about Satan and his angels. And the kings of the earth upon the earth. What's going to happen when Jesus comes? The kings of the earth are going to be punished and the host of the high ones, Satan and his angels, are going to be punished. And now notice verse 22. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. And now notice. And shall be shut up in the prison. And after many days shall they be what? Unfortunately, the King James translates visited. It's the identical word that is translated punished in verse 21. In other words, it should be translated punished. So my question is, how many stages to the punishment of the host of the high ones and the kings of the earth? How many stages? Two stages. Because it says in that day, they will be punished by being cast into prison. And after many days, they will be what? punished. So how many stages to the punishment? One punishment is to throw them into prison. The other stage of the of punishment takes place after they spend the many days in prison. Now my question is, how many days are they going to spend in prison? If you go to Revelation chapter 20, it gives you the answer. 
Satan and his angels and the wicked are going to be imprisoned, the wicked by death, and Satan is in his, and his angels in a living state are going to be imprisoned upon this earth for a thousand years. Is that the first stage of their punishment? Yes. But is that the final stage of their punishment? Absolutely not. Now, let me put it this way so you can understand what I'm saying. All of us that are here were born from our mothers onto our first life. All of us are living our first life, so to speak. If we should die before Jesus comes, what's going to happen when the Lord comes? We are going to resurrect in which resurrection? We're going to resurrect in the first resurrection, and we're going to be taken to heaven. We're going to see that very clearly in our last outline, going to be taken to heaven, and then we're going to live with Jesus how long? Only a thousand years? Or forever? Will God's people ever die again? No more death? How many times do the righteous die? How many times do the righteous die? Once. Right? Die, resurrect when Jesus comes, live eternally. Now let's talk about the wicked who die before Jesus comes or at the moment of the, of the second coming of Christ. All of the wicked are destroyed. They die. What death is that? That's their first death, right? How long do they remain dead? We're going to notice this in a moment. They remain dead for a thousand years. What happens at the end of the thousand years? At the end of the thousand years, they resurrect. Which life is that? They re resurrect to life for a second time. And then what are they going to suffer? They are going to suffer second death. Do you know that second death is always spoken of as taking place after the millennium? This proves, at least in my mind, beyond, beyond any shadow of doubt, that the wicked die, all of the wicked die when Jesus comes. And they're dead during the millennium. Because if they were not dead during the millennium, then they could not suffer second death. Because it, during the millennium, they're suffering the results of their first death. Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words, second death is their punishment after the thousand years. So here you have then, uh, when Jesus comes, the wicked are destroyed. They stay dead during the thousand years. After the thousand years, they resurrect. And when they resurrect, then they're judged and they suffer what? And they suffer second death. And where are the righteous during this period? They are in heaven. And what are they doing in heaven? Well, all the wicked are dead. And Satan and his angels are bound here. What are the righteous doing with the hosts of the high ones and with the kings of the earth? What are they doing? They're judging them. They're taking a look at their life record. And they're pronouncing sentence against them. And they're determining the reward which these which have been left behind will suffer. Now let's talk about what happens at the end of the thousand years with the saints. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse uh, 7. We're still focusing on the saints. It says there, in 20 verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Did you catch this point? When Jesus comes, where is Satan thrown? Prison. During the thousand years, what happens to Satan? He stays in prison. After the thousand years, what happens with Satan? He is released from his prison. Now the question, and he goes out to deceive the nations. The question is, what does it mean for Satan to be in prison? Actually, it has a very close relationship with what happens with the dead. Where does the power base of Satan reside? What makes Satan powerful? The fact that he has people to accomplish his purposes. If he had no people, how much power would he have? Absolutely done. Now, what happens to the wicked when Jesus comes? They all what? Die. Satan's power base is gone. And he's by himself on planet Earth with his angels. There are no wicked people to use or to deceive because they're all dead. But what happens after the thousand years? We've just noticed it. After the thousand years, the wicked what? Resurrect 
and Satan is released from his prison. Do you see that being bound and being released has to do with the wicked dying and resurrecting? In fact, it says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5 that the rest of the dead, referring to the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now let's go back to verse 7 again. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. Why can he deceive the nations now? Because they're all alive. They've been resurrected which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. You're saying, well, the focus here is on the wicked. No, the focus is not on the wicked. The focus is on the righteous. Let's continue reading. It says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth, and now notice, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city... What is the intention of the wicked? It is to take the city and destroy the saints. So who is still the center of focus in this outline? It is still the saints. Satan is not the center of focus. The center of focus is the New Jerusalem and the saints in the New Jerusalem. Are you understanding me? So what does the second outline emphasize? Second outline emphasizes that when Jesus comes, those who died will resurrect. Those who are alive and are righteous will be caught up. They'll be taken to the Father's house. They'll reign with Jesus for a thousand years. They'll also perform a work of judgment. Meanwhile, all of the wicked on earth are dead. Satan is bound because he has no one to tempt. During the thousand years, the righteous in heaven, the saints, will be judging. Satan and his angels will be judging the wicked. At the end of the thousand years, we find that the city will descend. We'll come to this a little bit later. The city will descend, and Satan and his angels and the wicked will surround the holy city. See, the focus is still on the righteous. They're in jeopardy because Satan has surrounded them. The wicked have surrounded them. They surround the holy city to try and destroy the city, but then the Bible says that fire comes down from heaven and destroys Satan and his angels and the wicked. There we have our second view. Does this second view complement the, the first view? Obviously. The first view emphasizes the condition of the earth and what happens with Satan. The second outline focuses on the saints, their resurrection, their work of judgment in heaven, and their jeopardy at the end of the thousand years when the wicked come against them. But when this second outline ends, you still have some questions that are not answered. Question number one, why were those inside the city saved and those outside the city lost? What determined whether you were inside or outside? Question number two, what is the name of the city the wicked surrounded? It doesn't say. It just calls it the beloved city. Number three, were the wicked ever convinced that they were wrong and God was right before they were destroyed? Number four, when did the saints enter the city? Were they in the city during the thousand years in heaven or did they enter the city uh, here on earth after the city descended? And finally, what was the judgment process during the thousand years like? What did the judgment process, what was it like, in other words? And so now you come to the third outline, and that is a focus upon the wicked, the unrighteous, which has not really been emphasized except in passing to say that they'll surround the city to try and destroy the saints in the city. But now we're going to have a more specific focus upon the wicked. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. And I'm only going to read one phrase of Revelation 20 and verse 5. It says there, but the rest of the dead, who must the rest of the dead be? The, if the righteous resurrected at the beginning of a thousand years, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. It must be whom? It must be the wicked, obviously. So in other words, after the thousand years, the wicked resurrect. And then something takes place. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. There's going to be a judgment. By the way, do you think God is going to destroy the wicked without, help, uh, without allowing the wicked to see why they're being destroyed? Is that the way God operates? He destroys people without giving them due process? No, God is going to give them due process. Now I want you to notice that due process in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. 
It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Which dead is this? The righteous or the unrighteous? It's the unrighteous. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now, how can dead people stand before God? Well, you're going to have to come to the series on the state of the dead because this is one of the verses we're going to study. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Is this a judgment? Yes, it is. Who are they judging? The dead. Which dead? The unrighteous. And the books were opened. And another book was opened. Notice, books and book, plural and singular, which is the book of life. And now notice, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. How are we saved? We're saved by grace through what? Through faith. But the Bible equally teaches that we will be judged and rewarded according to our works. Because our works show whether our faith was true and genuine or not. Amen. Faith without works is what? Yes. Is dead. And so it says here that the wicked who resurrect now were judged out of those things which were written where? In the books according to their works. What is written in the books? The works of the unrighteous. Notice what it continues saying. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, we'll talk about that also, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So what kept the wicked outside the holy city? When the judgment comes and the books are opened, it's revealed why they were outside the holy city. It doesn't specify what the works were. We have to wait till the final outline for that. And now notice, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I want you to, I want you to notice this. You have books and you have book, plural and singular. What do the books have? The books have the record of the life. It says their works. They were judged from the books according to their works. What is it that is contained in the book? Singular. In the book is the name. In other words, the book has names. The names of the righteous, the names of the saved. So what happens after the thousand years? The books are opened and all of the wicked that are surrounding the holy city will be able to see the record of their lives. They'll be able to see that their own choices, that their own works, excluded them from the holy city. They will see that God has been right in the way that he has dealt with them. And then God is going to bring out the book of life and he's going to say, your name is not written here. See, whose name was not found in the book of life, it says. So the purpose of bringing out the book of life was not to show who's going to be saved, but why people are what? Lost. In other words, look, is your name in this book? And what are they going to say? No. Now, do you want to know why? Look at the books. Are you understanding me? Now, the question is, when was their name erased from the book? Do you know that these records that will be shown to the wicked are the same records that the righteous examined during the thousand years? Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words, during the thousand years, we will examine the records of the world and Satan and his angels. We shall judge the world and we shall judge angels. And we will determine the what? The punishment according to their what? According to their works. And then after the thousand years, God will resurrect them and he'll open up the books again. The same records that we saw, and he's going to convince the wicked about their wickedness. He's going to say, this is, this is the reason why you were left outside the holy city. This is the reason why your name is not in the book of life. Look, your name is absent. And it's because of what is written where? In the books. Now, who is the center of focus here in this third panorama? The center of focus is the wicked, the judgment of the wicked, isn't it? It says that they stand before God, the books are opened, they're judged according to their works, they're not found in the book of life, and therefore they're cast where? They're cast into the lake of fire. 
So once again, the center of focus in this third outline is upon the wicked. Now, by the way, 2 Peter 3 adds uh, a confirmatory testimony to what we just noticed from Revelation 20. It says there in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with her fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then notice verse 13. It says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the what? Look for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. What's going to happen to the wicked after they have seen the records of their lives and they're convinced that God has been right in the way that he's dealt with them? They will be cast into the lake of fire. They will be burned up. And then what will God do? He will make a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. Now we need to go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. And let me tell you something about Revelation 21 and verse 1. This verse really belongs to chapter 20. You know, chapter divisions were not uh, put there by the original authors. Chapter divisions were added during the Middle Ages to make it easier for us to find verses. And sometimes chapters were divided in the wrong place. This is one place where there's a wrong division. Revelation 21 verse 1 should really be the climax of chapter 20. Let me read Revelation 21 verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. New heavens and new earth. Let me ask you, does God make a new heavens and a new earth after the wicked are destroyed in the fire or before? After. Is that after the wicked have been destroyed, Satan and his angels have been destroyed, is that where you have a new heavens and a new earth? Absolutely. So Revelation 21 verse 1 is really the climax after the wicked are thrown into the fire, they're destroyed, then God makes a new heavens and a new earth. Is that point clear? If you don't understand it that way, you're going to run into serious troubles. You say, what do you mean? Well, in a moment I'll explain it to you, but let me say that after the third outline you still have some questions. Question number one, what was in the books which condemned the wicked? It says they're works, but what kind of works? It doesn't specify. The fourth outline is, though. Another question, were the righteous in heaven during the thousand years, or were they on earth somewhere? Next question, what will life be like in the holy city? Still haven't seen that in the first three outlines. What will God be like? in the heavenly city. What will it be like to live with God in the holy city? None of those questions are answered in the first three outlines. And so there are still questions to be answered, and God adds a fourth outline about what life will be like with Him in the holy city. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, notice Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. This begins the fourth outline, the focus on God and the holy city. It says there in verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, if you read verse 2 as coming after the events of verse 1, what problem do you have? Come on, thinkers. Let me ask you, was the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, on earth when the wicked surrounded it? Yes. Were they destroyed when the, when the city was already on planet earth? Yes, they were. So does God make a new heavens and a new earth, and then after he makes a new heaven and an earth, new earth, the holy city descends? No. The holy city descends, the wicked surround it, they're destroyed, and then God makes a new heavens and a new earth. But if you make chapter 21 verse 1 previous to 21 verse 2, it gives the impression that God makes a new heaven and a new earth, and then the new Jerusalem descends. That's why I say that Revelation 21 verse 2 begins a new sequence. It speaks about the moment when the new Jerusalem descended to the earth, and then it's going to talk once again about the wicked being around the city and being destroyed. Actually, you have four outlines in Revelation 20, verse 1, through Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. This is the fourth outline, which is going to explain some things that are not found in the first three outlines. Now let's take a look at it. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. By the way, are the wicked, are, are the righteous in the holy city when the wicked surround it? Yes. So where, the, where must the righteous have been during the thousand years? Where must they have been? Did they descend in the holy city? It has to be. Because they're inside the holy city. The wicked surround the holy city. The righteous are in the holy city. The, heaven, the city came down from heaven, which means that the righteous must have been in the city, in heaven, during the thousand years. Are you understanding me or not? I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Find any of that focus in the previous three outlines? No, now it's talking about the city and what it's going to be like living with God. Verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. No more funerals. Praise the Lord, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. It says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. By the way, I don't know whether you noticed something very interesting here. It speaks about, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Saw is in what tense? The verb is in what tense? past. He sees the city descend, but from that point on, all of the verbs are what? Future. I don't know whether you notice that or not. Verb tenses are very important. Notice, verse 3 again, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he what? Will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Has this hope been consummated yet? When the city descends? Not yet. Verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more pain, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. So when the holy city descends, has any of this materialized yet? The holy city descends and God says, there shall no longer be any of these things. Because the city descends, the wicked are resurrected, they surround the holy city, and these things have not been fulfilled yet. Are you understanding me or not? Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. Good, wow. You're still with me, praise the Lord. Okay, now let's go to verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I, what is it? What's the tense of the verb again? I will give unto him that, uh, that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. See, at the point when he's speaking these words, the holy city has just descended to earth. Sin and sinners have not been destroyed yet. So these promises from that point are still what? They are still future. Once the wicked are all destroyed, Satan and his angels are all destroyed, then he wipes away all tears from their eyes. And you know, some, some people say, Pastor, do you think that maybe if I have a relative outside the holy city and I see that relative, that I'll probably shed a tear if it says here that there'll be no more tears. It says here there will be no more tears after you have a new heavens and a new earth. Yeah. Not at the time when the holy city is on earth. I believe that there will be tears, but after this God will wipe away all tears and he'll lead us to the river of life after sin and sinners have been destroyed. And then I want you to notice verse 8. It reaches the same climax all over again. Verse 8. It says, but the fearful... Now we know the specific sins that are written in the books. See, now it's specified. See, more detail. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers 
and idolaters. By the way, are these all violations of the Ten Commandments? Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes. So we know what was written in the books. What was written in the books? Transgression of the law. So it says abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. All liars shall have their part. Notice, what's that again? Shall. shall have. Are they thrown into the lake of fire when the city descends at that instant? No. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is what? Which is the second death. By the way, did you notice that the lake of fire is mentioned three times in three of the four outlines? Revelation chapter 27 to 9, it says that the wicked surround the city, fire descends from heaven, devours them. Then in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 15, through 15, it says the records are open, they've shown the record of their lives from the books, they see that their name is not in the book of life, it says they're thrown into the lake of fire. Now wait a minute, hadn't they been thrown into the lake of fire in, the, in outline number 2? And then... You have them thrown into the lake of fire here in 21 verse 8 again. So I suppose there are three lakes of fire. No, what is happening here? You have repetitive outlines from different perspectives. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The first perspective is what happens to Satan at the beginning, during, and after the millennium. The second perspective is what happens to the saints. They resurrect. They're transported to heaven with Jesus. During the thousand years, they reign with Jesus. They're not trampled upon anymore. They judge Satan and his angels and the wicked. After the thousand years, they're in the holy city, so they must have come down with the holy city. And the wicked surround the city because they want to destroy the saints. See there? And then Satan and his angels and the wicked are destroyed in the fire. But God says, I have something more to tell you now about the wicked. You've seen about Satan and the earth. You've seen about the righteous. Now I want to tell you about the wicked. They were judged. Records were opened. They were shown that by their works they did not deserve to be in the holy city. They were shown that they were not in the book of life. And after they were convinced of the righteousness of their sentence, then they were thrown into the lake of fire. And then God made a new heavens and a new earth. Oh, but hold on. I haven't told you about life in the holy city yet. And so now in chapter 21 and verse 2, he speaks about the whole holy city, New Jerusalem, descending from heaven. And he speaks about what life will be like when the wicked are destroyed. How there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying. How we will be able to drink from the water of life freely. And so when you have studied all four outlines, you have a complete picture of what things are going to be like. What's going to happen with Satan, what's going to happen with the earth, what's going to happen with the righteous, what's going to happen with the wicked, what's going to happen in the city, and what it's going to be like to live with God. In other words, you cannot read Revelation 20 in a linear fashion. It runs in cycles. See, this is where people goof up in their study of the Bible. I know that's a terrible expression to use, goof up. <laughs> but people get messed up because, because they, they say, oh, I want to see what the Bible says about the millennium. They start out in chapter 20 and verse 1, and they read straight through, and they think they're getting things in chronological order. They're not getting things in chronological order. They're getting four cycles, each with its particular emphasis. Now, I want to bring this to an end. Amen? <laughs> it's lunchtime. <laughs> We have to go eat the food which perisheth. <laughs> Two verses in closing. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 and verse 15. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. There's a lot of people today who don't want you to talk about the Ten Commandments. Although Protestants more and more are saying we need to get back to the Ten Commandments. For example, no gay marriage. Because there's a commandment that says that thou shalt not commit adultery. But when you tell them, what about the Sabbath? Well, that one was nailed. Inconsistent. See, the devil has tried to convince people that the law was nailed to the cross because he wants to get rid of the Sabbath. Because no thinking person would say that God got rid of his Ten Commandment law. It's absurd. It's ridiculous to have a society without a law. It's senseless. And people know it. But in order to get rid of the Sabbath, they have to crucify the law and then uncrucify nine of the ten. It's like you have gangrene on one finger. You cut off all ten and sew nine back on. It makes no sense. 
Chapter 22 and verse 14, and I'm reading from the King James, and I believe that this is the best translation, even though other translations say wash their robes. This is the best translation. And when I do the Genesis series, I'll have a whole lecture on the reason why. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Not wash their robes, do his commandments. By the way, does Revelation in other places speak about those who keep his commandments? The dragon's wrath against those who keep the commandments of God. Here are they who keep the commandments of God. So it's proper to, to, to translate this or to say, bless, to read, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But now notice the other group. For without, that is outside, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, all violators of the Ten Commandments. In other words, the city is full with command, filled with commandment keepers. Outside, it's filled with commandment breakers. And it says, and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a what? A lie. It says in Revelation 21, 27, that nothing which defileth will enter there. Matthew 5, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 1 John 3, 1 says that whoever has this hope of the coming of Jesus purifies himself even as he is pure. And Hebrews 12, verse 14 says we're supposed to follow peace with all men in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So what God is inviting us to do is to be inside the holy city. But in order to be inside the holy city, we must love Jesus. We must commit our lives to Jesus. We must love him so much that we want to obey his commandments. We don't enter the city because we keep the commandments. We enter the city because we love Jesus and keep his commandments. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Oh, I'll keep the commandments and then God will open up the gates so I can go in. No, I love Jesus and I will keep his commandments and when he examines me in the judgment, he will see that out of love I have obeyed him and then he will let me in through the gates into the city. So we have a work of overcoming in this life in order to be prepared for the coming of Christ. May God help us to make the necessary preparation because I believe Jesus is at the door. Amen. You know, you have Charlie and then you have Francis and I was noticing this morning on the Weather Channel that you have another hurricane forming which is coming towards, towards the, uh, the East Coast. One right after another. The turmoil in the world is incredible. The political hatred which exists in, among parties. I mean, certainly, we're right around the corner from the final events that are going to take place in this world. And we need to draw together, draw close to Jesus, and dedicate quality time to him in the edification of our characters. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word this morning. We thank you because you've shown that there are two destinies inside the city and outside the city. We accept your call to come into the holy city, to drink from the water of life freely. I ask, Lord, that you will impact and touch each heart, that decisions will be made at this very moment for eternity. I thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.